if you, you know, have a desire to experience like nutrition through different cultures, like the army is one way that you can definitely do that. Do you ever have so many questions and no one to ask, so they're just wasting away on Google searches you'll forget about in an hour or so? We had that same problem, and that's why we created the RD to be podcast, a resource for dietetic and nutrition students looking for answers that their peers don't have. We are students Macy and Emily and registered dietitian Carl Barnes. We engage in conversations and learn from RDs. Join us weekly as we gain insight into the unique journeys of registered dietitians all over the country. Welcome back to another week of the RD to be podcast. I'm Carl Barnes. I'm your registered dietitian host. I'm really excited uh, for this week. So we have a, a friend of mine, uh, Stephanie Menno. She's a captain in the U.S. Army. Uh, we actually did our internships together, um, both grad school and internships together through the Army. Um, she's currently working with the Army's holistic health and fitness program. I'm going to let her go um, more into that. And then we've um, actually got some fun this week. So we've got some questions that were texted in. Um, so uh, Emily will be, will be sliding those in. So uh, without further ado, Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm at RD2B at the University of Maryland. Um, thanks, Stephanie, for joining us. Um, so I guess we can just hop right in. Um, so what does your current job entail? Um, and how did you end up there? Yeah, thanks so much for having me guys really excited to be here. Um, my current job, so like Carl said, holistic health and fitness dietitian, um, what does that mean exactly? So kind of consider it to be um, like a sports team for a, a college, how they have like their strength coaches, their physical trainers, their physical therapists, athletic trainers, and then they have usually a dietitian. So especially for like your big um, schools, like, you know, like Alabama, Clemson, Mm -hmm. UW, um, all those big programs that have really good nutrition programs. So it's kind of similar to that just with soldiers. Um, mm -hmm. So I work with strength and conditioning coaches, physical therapists, occupational therapists, athletic trainer, sports psychologists, um, and, and soon like civilian dietitians and diet technicians. So um, it's about a 37 person team. And our main goal is to um, help soldiers be the most high functioning soldier athlete that they can be. Um, so that's in a nutshell, what holistic health and fitness is. Awesome. So is it, so your team is of 37. How many people do you overlook? Is it like a special team or is it everybody? Within? So we work with a brigade size element and in the army that varies. So my brigade is fairly small. It's about 1200 people. Um, I'm in a, a medical brigade. So um, providers, medics, admin personnel. Um, but then there's other units that are infantry so like your standard army guy that you would think about um and those are anywhere from three to four thousand people it just depends so um i'm in a fairly small sized unit so like like a d2 school versus a d1 school kind of thing cool so how did you end up um getting that job stuff like that like working I feel like that's a specialized kind of role yeah I was really fortunate to be in the right place at the right time basically mm -hmm. is how that worked um, I started making this transition um, into my current position in 2017 so I completed my internship in 2016 I have to go do the math in my head um, and then I was on staff at the hospital where I am stationed for about a year they're like, hey, we have this really cool six-month pilot program. We're going to put you with this team of um, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, and then a strength conditioning coach. And you're going to go to this unit that's about 700 soldiers big for six months, and you're going to figure out how to help them. And it was very little guidance. That's about all I knew. Um, showed up, and um, nobody knew what I was there for. So it was about two months of getting my feet under me um, before we actually get, got rolling. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, like it was over. Um, but luckily, they started doing this on a larger scale across the army um, about nine months later. And then I got sent back to that same unit for two years. And then now I'm in my second um, permanent job doing this just at a different organization. Um, that's a bigger organization. So um, because I was part of that original small, tiny pilot, um, they've just kind of kept me in this position for continuity. So I got really lucky to be where I am. 
So do you think, did you think you were going to find yourself there? Like when you were doing your internship and stuff, is this what you had picture, not picture yourself, but is this where you thought you would end up or like, what did you envision your life to be when you were an intern? So yes and no. Um, I think a lot of time when you decide like the people who come into the um, army Baylor program and they say, I'm going to be a dietitian for the army, right? You think like, I'm going to work directly with soldiers. And then we get into the internship and we realize that no, you're pretty much going to be like a regular dietitian. You're either going to work in food service or you're going to be clinical or you're going to be an outpatient. Um, You're just going to rotate a lot through all of those things. So you might have an opportunity to interact with soldiers, but not like as your full-time job. So Mm -hmm. I kind of like tempered that expectation. And then I thought I was just going to go through all those normal roles. And then I got the chance to do this job. And I was like, well, this is everybody's dream job as a military dietitian. Um, Well, most people anyway. So um, yes and no. I, I thought about it really early on and then I kind of lost that hope and now I'm doing it. So it's, it's really kind of neat to be where I thought I was going to be. That's great to hear. Um, cause I know like a lot of people, um, probably defer from where like they want to be or not where they want to be, but like where they think they're going to be. Um, so many students that I know, like myself, I like to feel prepared. So do you feel, did you, yeah, did you feel like you were prepared for this job at all? Or like, I know you said you were kind of like thrown into it with no direction. So how did you like navigate that and stuff? Um, I, I think that I had some really good instructors in the graduate program that did a really great job of teaching us the basics of like performance nutrition and um, how to help soldiers through that lens of performance nutrition concepts. And so even though that's something that again, I didn't really get a whole lot of opportunity to use in my internship, mm-hmm. um, it did prepare me for this job a little bit. And then I had some good mentors that I could lean on. Like my previous boss, um, when I was at the hospital actually went on to do a similar position in Colorado and I was able to contact her, um, and she gave me some good insights. So I feel prepared in the sense that I had people to lean on, but going into the job, there was not much given to me, but it was kind of nice. Cause then I got to like, make it what I wanted it to be. And it still kind of is that way. Um, So they've put a lot of new dietitians into these positions that are just kind of like frustrated and nervous because they don't know what to expect. But I always try to frame it from that lens of you can do with this what you want. Like this is your opportunity to create this position because it's never been done before. Um, So it's kind of nice that we didn't have those really structured guidelines as to what we were supposed to be doing. So is this the first thing you've done within the army for being an RD or did you have other jobs and opportunities beforehand? So my first job was, um, I was like the assistant chief at the hospital for nutrition care. So, um, I worked under another dietitian to manage inpatient, outpatient, um, all the dietitians and other, um, like the techs and everything that worked in in those two organizations. Mm -hmm. And so that was more admin. And then I did do some patient care. Um, But then I pretty swiftly transitioned into this job working strictly with soldiers. Um, So I had a little bit of time and it was interesting because I went from being an intern at the hospital that I then went to work at as the assistant chief. So I was kind of like the boss for all my preceptors like immediately, which was really interesting. And that's not an uncommon thing um, in the military. So it's a fun dynamic. I'm sure. So with the job that you have now, what are you most passionate about? Like what makes you want to keep doing it? I think just helping soldiers. I mean, I love the military. It's um, kind of like my family business. So Mm -hmm. my dad was in for a really long time. Both my brothers joined as well. Um, And I've been in since 2010. I was in the reserves before I went into the army active duty. So Mm -hmm. I really just enjoy working with the population that I'm in. It's super diverse. I learned so much from people every day. Like I've worked with um, people from every walk of life, every like spot on the globe you can possibly think of. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've had the opportunity to work with a soldier who is an Olympic level weightlifter. So he was trained for the Olympics. Um, We've had people who have come from like the semi-professional sports um, arena that have joined the army. Um, so you have people who are at high levels of, you know, athleticism that teach you things. And so that's been really fun too, um, to get to work with such a diverse 
patient soldier population. Yeah, I'm sure. So what are some things that you did as a student and like an intern or even an undergrad student that made you want, or more so as an undergrad that made you want to go the Baylor route to do, to work with the army or was. Yeah. So I didn't even start school um, as a dietitian. I actually started as an art student for a year. So I joined the army out of high school to pay for college. And I was a photographer in the air force. That was my job or a videographer, photographer. Um, and that's what I was going to do for a living, I thought. So mm -hmm. I went to school for a whole year before I left for my first uh, round of training for the military. And when I got back, I realized like, I don't want to do that. I want to, I like nutrition. I, I think it's fun. And mm -hmm. I want to be able to teach other people about it. So I switched my major. And then um, probably a year into that, I found out about this Baylor program through my dad's um, hospital commander that he deployed with his second deployment to Kuwait I forget he did a couple while I was in high school and college but um, mm -hmm. she was an active duty dietitian and when we picked him up from that deployment in North Carolina at Fort Bragg we met her for dinner and she handed me this packet of stuff for Baylor she's like you're going to be a nutrition major here you need to do this program <laughs> and that was it like I just never did anything else I never had any other goal in mind Mm -hmm. Um, and she gave me a phenomenal reference letter and here I am today. So, um, it was just this one pivotal moment. I don't know if I ever would have found out about that program had she not told me, cause we didn't have anybody come talk to us about it at school. Um, it wasn't really heavily advertised. So, um, I was just really fortunate to have that opportunity to meet someone who was passionate about it and shared that with me. That's awesome that you were able to have someone like not only come to talk to you, but someone that was like, like close, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, that's awesome. So I, so as Carl mentioned earlier, we had a few students that texted us just to let us know um, what kind of questions we would like to ask you. Um, and one girl, Faith, was wondering, how do people get the proper nutrition when in the army and when they're on base? Like, are the foods and portions chosen for them? Or do they have like free range to do whatever they want? Or how does that look? kind of a mix of both. So if you look at like a campus dining facility, um, it's fairly similar in terms of what the soldier dining facility looks like. Um, mm -hmm. I know there's been a push on my installation to have, to give soldiers the ability to ask for more specifically of things like quality protein and carbohydrate choices, just so they can get adequate amounts, but um, it's, they pay and they go in and it's kind of like a la carte um, or like buffet style. So they can get as much of whatever for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they also have, you know, your standard like Burger King, Arby's, Panda Express, all on base. Um, so it's like a little community and mm -hmm. they have free reign to really get whatever they want. Once they get beyond like the initial training phase of like basic training, um, they can choose to go to the dining facility or not. Like they can go to Burger King every day if they want to. And that's the yeah. unfortunate reality that a lot of them do. So, so what does it look like? Um, like when they're in basic training and stuff like that? Um, so I went through basic training uh, back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And from my personal experience, it's, it's fascinating. From a, a dietitian's perspective now, like looking back, mm -hmm. um, having gone through that, I can kind of sympathize, empathize a little bit with my soldiers that come through and have these struggles with eating. Like, you know, they just got out of basic training and now they're trying to figure out how to like do the right thing in a healthy way. Um, because when you go through basic training, you're given about 10 minutes to eat. So you have to get in and get out very quickly. And they, they like yell at you. If you get certain food, they intimidate mm -hmm. you like not to go for dessert. Um, but basically you're given the small window of opportunity to like shove your face full of as much as you can. And I just remember feeling so sick after leaving. Cause like, I don't remember what I ate. I just know it was on my plate and it got into my mouth and, um, I would just mm -hmm. eat way beyond the point of like fullness so you just lose all those senses of hunger fullness cues and in that point like you can only eat three times a day they don't give you the opportunity to eat in between meals so mm -hmm. um that can kind of create some weird food relationships that i've found um can cause issues for soldiers later on and i think there's more research being done in like the basic training arena and how how nutrition works in that um mm -hmm. in, in that setting and, and what that might do to a soldier um, in terms of like eating behaviors. 
what about if they're deployed? So do you work with people that are overseas and like active duty or I don't know what like the term what the right terminology is? Yeah, so they would be deployed. Um, so my my last unit actually went um, on a trip and they were in the Philippines. They went to Thailand, but unfortunately I was pregnant and you can't travel like that when you're pregnant. So mm -hmm. I missed out on it. But had I not been, I would have gone. Um, but yeah, there's there's tons of um, my classmates who have gone on deployments in this role. So um, like Kuwait, Afghanistan, um, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. So a lot of different places. And it's fairly similar in those settings to um, like back home in that they have a standard DFAC where they typically make fresh food as food as often as possible. And they get like their produce and stuff from the economy, like wherever they are. Mm -hmm. um, but then the soldiers have the opportunity to go out and eat the food that's like local. So that presents an interesting challenge in places like the Philippines where everything's contaminated and then everyone ends up with, you know, GI problems. So um, it's definitely different uh, when you're traveling and depending on the environment that you're in, if they have like the packaged meals versus a fresh mm -hmm. meal, that can pose some challenges, but um, it's, it's unique for sure. And it's, it's kind of fun to work with that. Cause I did work on some of the logistics of planning for the food for that trip to the Thailand and Philippines deployment. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to kind of see what goes into that. And it's really interesting how much they have to think of ahead of time. So what, what does go into that? Um, just like rationing. So figuring out like something as simple as how much water they're going to need. Right. Because mm -hmm. in the Philippines, you can't drink the, the water. You have to have bottled water. So they were going to only give people, um, there's like standards in the military for how much water you should have based on the environment. And it's up to like 11 liters a day in like extremely hot environments, I think is the number. And they were at like the minimum, like giving them the bare minimum amount of water every day. And I was like, guys, it's like 90 plus degrees with 100% humidity. Um, so we were able to bump up that ration. So yeah. that's something that like, you know, they don't usually have a dietitian in the room, but it was kind of nice that I could be there and help them. Mm -hmm. Kind of adjust those things and then encouraging them to get like you know here's some pitfalls in your your meal planning where you might run into like you know you don't have enough fresh fresh fruits and vegetables you might see some vitamin deficiencies things like that mm -hmm. so you can kind of give that insight that they're not necessarily thinking about um when they're doing that ordering piece so how does it how do you how does planning and like rationing for fresh fruit and like produce and stuff compare to like the packaged meals like what like what process goes into that um so like the the package meals there's a nutrition facts label for all of those and they're pretty heavily fortified um but for those they're really not supposed to eat them beyond 21 days like there's kind of a time limit on how long you can sustain on just those packaged um mm -hmm. they're called mres a meal ready to eat um and then for all the other rations that they have um things like fresh fruit to give you stuff like vitamin c can become kind of important because that's not really something that they're going to heavily fortify. So you can look at like those nutrition facts labels and figure out like the daily values, like where you're kind of lacking and then mm -hmm. figure out like the produce that would kind of fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. So just like oranges, bananas, apples, yeah, fresh salad, just really simple stuff. But again, working with the local economy and like, what do they actually have in that region? So, so if I were to open a package, right, what would be in there? Like I've seen <laughs> movies and like they have packages. I'm like, what's in there? So, um, they're getting really sophisticated these days. They basically have they have like pizza, they have tacos. Um, hmm. And the pizza one reminds me. I don't know if in grade school you ever had like the square pizza with the square pepperonis on it. That's exactly what the MRE pizza oh. reminds me of. It was like nostalgia when I took a bite of it. I think we had it at. Um, at this field event that Carl and I were both on in our internship at Diffnac, um, the nutrition, they gave us like the pizza one. Um, but then they'll have stuff. So they'll have like an entree, right? It could be like beef stew or um, mm -hmm. it could be a vegetarian one. Um, and then they'll give you like a side. So there might be like a piece of bread and then like cheese, like the spreadable cheese. Um, yeah. Sometimes there's dried fruit. Occasionally you'll hit like a gold mine with some Skittles or some kind of candy and people get really excited about that. Um, and there's also a heater pack. So you can like heat up the entree and like a side and it's, mm -hmm. uh, you add just like a little bit of water to it and the chemical reaction heats it up. 
but they sometimes don't work very well. So you don't really want to rely on it getting hot. <laughs> so a lot of people just eat them cold. Um, but I don't think that they taste bad. I don't know. My dad was in the military my whole life and he used to bring them home and we'd get like super excited about them. And um, especially because when he would get them, there'd be a brownie in there and the brownie was so good. So we'd always fight over the brownie. Um, but I don't think they taste that bad, but you definitely, after eating them for two weeks straight, you're going to have some stomach problems. <laughs> so with like the pizza and the stuff or for pizza like for example how does it not go bad so they're shelf stable um for three years and oh, it's, wow. yeah so it's there's a lot of research and development that goes into those mm -hmm. in massachusetts they do all of the science behind how they keep it stable but i mean it's it's similar to any like shelf stable product right they're just putting a lot of like stabilizers in there and they package it and they make sure that it's nicely um, airtight so that nothing gets in um, and they're inspected so Carl used to be a, <laughs> a vet inspector and he would um, go through and you inspect the MREs and make sure there's no damage um, and then you have to get them off the shelf after they're expired every three years mm -hmm. so, but yeah they are fairly stable in most environments. So it kind of segues into the next question so um, is there a lot of variety and what um, people in the military army, they eat. So, I mean, like you said, with like the packages, they have like the beef stew and the pizza and other stuff like that, but is it, you know, there are 10 different varieties and then you're over, um, or like you're eating them over and over again, or what does the variety look like for? Yeah, so there is a pretty good variety. I don't remember off the top of my head how many menus there are, but there's mm -hmm. a database, the Comrade C O M R A D database, and anybody can go on there, and it's really neat. Like they built it kind of like um, it's like a you can put stuff into like a shopping cart, so you can take components from different rations and build a meal, and it will give you like a nutrition facts label for that meal. So I I often show soldiers this tool because a lot of times people don't like everything that's in their meal right but if you're around a group of people you can play like the swap game mm -hmm. um, so they can know like hey if I pair this and this I get this much carb this much protein um, so how about you trade me your peanut butter and I'll give you my cheese that kind of thing um, so you can you can definitely find variety in them but people get kind of set on like one or two menus that they really like and then mm -hmm. there's always going to be that like one like the cheese omelet or whatever it was that nobody wants that one so um, like you don't want to be the last one to pick up your MREs, but, um, they, they usually every like three years, the menus will update too. So they're constantly updating them. But, um, so that's just the, the one package meal. There's a different, there's a couple different kinds and there's like enhancement packages that have like mm -hmm. products that are caffeinated, um, or that have more carbohydrates for like high intensity missions. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of nice for them to get. It's like a little treat when they get those. Um, but then just like the normal food, like in the cafeteria, um, we run off of like a 21 day, 14 day cycle menu, um, that updates semi-frequently. Um, so there's routine in there as well. And they have like specialty bars and all of that. So they try to make the food in the dining facility interesting anyway. So, yeah. So you were mentioning that like they'll swap stuff. So how aware are they of what they should be eating or do some are like, are some of them like super aware and some of them like clueless or is it like, like yeah. what kind of mentality do they have with it? Cause you said some yeah. people go like Burger King all the time. Like, yeah. So there's no, you can't assume anything about soldiers and their level of um, nutrition education, even um, providers that I've worked with, like other healthcare providers, right? You can't assume a doctor knows anything about nutrition. Um, I've had some soldiers that are super high speed on nutrition that have never gone to school for it, like have mm -hmm. a high school diploma and that's it. And they know a lot of stuff that they've taught themselves. And I have other people that know nothing. Um, yeah. Like today, someone asked me, and this person is a fairly senior ranking individual has probably been in for about 12 years. Um, and we were talking about ruck march nutrition. So their kind of standard is to do a 12 mile ruck. So it's 12 miles with a 35 pound pack. And ideally you want to do it in like three to four hours three hours is like a good time. So they're, they're trucking. Um, and he asked me, and he's probably done several of these in his life. And he asked me today that, uh, if fasted rucking is a good idea, he's like, I've heard that it's a good idea to fast before a ruck. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. 
So I'm constantly dispelling these myths about nutrition that make zero sense. I had a soldier ask me if eating too many bananas would be really dangerous and he was serious. So, um, it's, it's so interesting to me because like it just makes you feel like you're value added at that point. Like I need to be here. <laughs> I need to help these yeah. people. Um, I can imagine everything. going on what, what, what's a rock? Like a so you have like a heavy backpack on, like 35, uh-huh. 45 pounds, and then you're walking at a fairly quick pace. Um, I can imagine doing that for three, four hours without eating. Yeah. And not eating before too. Like he was saying, like going into it, not having eaten anything. Oh, so, wow. Hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's some different schools of thought out there. And that's even um, at the highest ranks of like the yeah. unit commanders who, you know, what they say is God. And so if you can't, get them saying the right thing, then you're just kind of not going to have a lot of sway. But um, yeah, I find that people are all over the map when it comes to nutrition, but it's job security. So I can't be mad that people don't know anything because that's what I'm there for is to teach them. So um, that's what I really enjoy though, is like seeing people like get something out of what I'm teaching them. Mm -hmm. Like seeing that big shift in thought, like, oh, maybe I should eat before this ruck. And then they do it and they see how much better they perform. And it's like, it's not that... It's not rocket science, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. so I know you said that ranking kind of has like an influence on, I guess, the people that aren't as experienced. So how does it, like you're a captain. So how mm-hmm. does that, like what kind of ranking is that for someone that's not well-versed in military ranking? Um, so in the army, captain is the third rank and the officer ranks so there's two lieutenant ranks and then captain so I rank I outrank two other officers and then all of the enlisted people so um, like my dad for instance was in for like 39 years Mm -hmm. and he was the highest enlisted rank you can get but the moment I became an officer I outranked him with zero time in service so um, that's always interesting for like super junior officers when they're talking to really high up enlisted people because you technically do outrank them just by virtue of being an officer, but they have potentially a lot more knowledge than you. Um, So we lean very heavily on our enlisted soldiers because they're the ones that um, teach us a lot about the army. But yeah, the officers um, outrank all of the enlisted. And then we have, um, I just blanked out, nine ranks, 10 ranks of officers. (laughs) I was like, it's, oh, so yeah, you have 06, So 01 through 06 are your lieutenant to colonel, and then you have your general officer ranks. So those are like the star people, like the ones that work in DC that have a lot of sway um, over the military. So yeah, they're everybody's boss. (laughs) (laughs) So that's pretty cool. I mean, going in um, as an RD. So can RDs go in as enlisted or... Um, so we have, we have a enlisted counterpart who is like a diet tech. They're not certified, Mm -hmm. but they are considered like a nutrition care specialist. Um, and they work in the hospitals as like a diet tech. Um, but typically if you have a college degree, um, you would come in as an officer. So a dietitian would commission, um, and become an officer and they would usually come in as like the second highest off or the second Lieutenant rank, Mm -hmm. um, because they have probably like a master's degree. So your level of education can kind of determine what you come in as. So if they're, if you're out there planning to become an officer in the army um, and you have a master's degree, you'd probably be like a first lieutenant, which is an O2. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So. Is there a way to keep working up? Like, can you become higher than a captain as an RD or are you capped or what does yeah, that mean? You definitely can. We can get all the way up to um, O6, which is the colonel rank. Um, mm-hmm. We've never had a general officer that's a dietitian. There's that's kind of like uh, not really in our career progression. Um, we don't have like the, the jobs for that, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could become my next position would be a major in 04, um, which I'd be eligible to apply or sit. It's a board. So you send up like a, a file of all your information and then you have mm-hmm. um, evaluations that get sent up. And my first look is next year. So next March, I'll get my first, my first look is my below the zone, meaning like I probably won't get picked up because it's like, you know, if you're really, really stellar and we have the spots, like you can take people 
Mm -hmm. um, for that first look, but typically it's the second look where you would get picked up or the third. Um, so it'd be a few more years, but I'd be eligible for promotion should I make it through that whole process. And it's pretty, it gets pretty um, um, competitive once you get above captain. So that's where people tend to fade <laughs> if they're not really into it. So, so what does it, what does it look like to be an RD at a higher level? Um, it's similar to if you like think about a hospital setting like nutrition care because I worked at a children's hospital when I was in um, my undergrad as a diet tech and we had like the lead dietitian who oversaw mm -hmm. the whole department and like managed the schedules and hired people um, once you get up to like an 04 if you're in like a smaller clinic that's probably going to be like a job you would have mm -hmm. and then like the higher 05 and 06 colonel ranks um, would be at like a bigger um, hospital like where I am at Madigan it's like a full-fledged like functioning hospital, um, like mm -hmm. ICU, all that stuff. Um, so we have a couple higher ranking dietitians because they have a very big department to manage. Um, but there's also dietitians who have gone on to be deputy commanding officers for the hospital. So basically like the second in charge of the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. But you're kind of like not a dietitian at that point, you're hospital administration. Um, so you can take different avenues. Um, you can go into like recruiting um, you can go into um, company command time, which is where you would be like commanding like a hundred and something people. You're not mm -hmm. a dietitian. You're like a boss for a bunch of soldiers and you mm -hmm. manage them. So there's things you can do that aren't just being a dietitian um, once you get to like 0304. Cool. Yeah. So have you ever gone to a different, um, like have you ever been stationed anywhere and like have to work with? So I'm, I'm pretty, I'm in like this weird place where I've been at the same unit or the same installation in Washington for five years. And that like never happens. That's like not a thing. Um, typically after three years you move um, because mm -hmm. it's career progression. Um, but with the holistic health and fitness um, pilot program and now the permanent position, I've been lucky enough just to move around at my installation. Um, because before I would only be able to work at the hospital and I'm kind of limited in what I can do there. So they're going to move me to another place, um, and another installation, like different state. Um, but with this new job, I'm bouncing around to places that aren't the hospital. There's like multiple different organizations on this base that I could work at. So I'm just moving in between. So I'll be here for eight years before I move, <laughs> which oh. is unheard of. Yeah. So, but my husband's also in the military. So um, they do consider that and it's provided us some stability since he's stationed here as well. So could he potentially, could they be like, Hey, you're moving to Fort Myers or something. I don't even know um, if that's possible. I just know that's a base around here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, they, they could definitely like move me. Um, he's retiring next month out of the mm -hmm. army, so he's not moving, but, um, it is possible for them to all of a sudden be like, we need you somewhere else and we're going to send you somewhere else. Um, that does happen, unfortunately. Yeah. So. so you're in Washington state, right? Yep. I'm in Washington state. So is that where you did your um, internship or did you do that in Texas or? Well, yes, yeah, so I, I did my graduate, like the didactic portion in San Antonio um, mm -hmm. through the Baylor program. It was physically at Baylor um, we went there one time and we saw the bears and that was our Baylor experience <laughs> um, but after that that was about a year because I did like my officer training before that and then we did the nine-month program and then we went to Washington State um, to Joint Base Lewis McCord which is where I'm stationed now and that's where I did my internship okay. and then I stayed so they had a position there and I put my name in the hat to stay um, and they let me stay which they don't often do um, mm -hmm but I did get to stay. So it all worked out and here I am. That's awesome. So yeah. what other, or any other bases like interesting to you? Like, would you want to go back down to Texas? Would you want to come over to like Maryland, go Walter Reed or like what makes Madigan? Mad what, what was uh, yeah, Madigan. So that's the hospital that's yeah. at Joint Base Lewis McCord. Um, it's been nice to stay here given that my husband is here and um, like, his family is here. So, um, it's nice, but, uh, I would like to move somewhere else on the East coast. I'm from closer to the East coast. And so, mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at a position 
that's in Pennsylvania, I've kind of got my eyes on, um, but it wouldn't be for another couple of years. I'm just trying to get some more information about it. But um, yeah, you definitely like in the military want to start making decisions about career advancement pretty early um, mm -hmm. because you need to know like when that job's going to become open, what do they recommend as the qualifications for it, the rank, if there's any like specialty certifications Mm -hmm. um and like is there anybody that sits there now that you could like talk to to just get information um so you're always thinking about your next position in the military because like I said typically you're only in the job that you're in for two to three years before you're going to move so so with your position in the holistic um nutrition could you potentially bring it to a base in Pennsylvania and like develop it there or how would that work well, the job I'm looking at there is actually, um, it's, it's um, a position that's very similar, but they've had this program established for several years now. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not the same holistic health and fitness title, but it's like mm -hmm. the same thing. You work with a multidisciplinary team, um, seeing people as a dietitian, providing um, nutrition care to help them become more physically ready and all that. So um, it's very similar. And that's kind of why I'm drawn to it because it's, well established. There's people that have worked there for a while that know how it works. And um, I think it'll be a good transition from the job I'm in right now and also bring me like much closer to home, like a six hour car ride versus a six hour flight. So I'm kind yeah. of looking forward to that if it works out. Yeah. I used to do the five, six hour flight from San Diego back to the East Coast. So oh my I gosh. understand the Red wow. Bull that could be in the yeah. airport and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so what kind of, like when you became an RD, did you expect to be working with such a big team? Did you like think it was going to be you and like a few other people? Like what did you envision a team to look like? Yeah, no, I never expected it to be what it is right now. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that in any of my schooling I don't, I don't remember if we ever talked about working as part of like an interdisciplinary team in the aspect that I'm doing it now. Cause like I said, it's very similar to like a collegiate setting where you're part of a sports mm -hmm. uh, performance team. Um, mm -hmm. So like I have friends that did that. I have a friend who works um, at a pretty big school, a couple of them actually, and um, ran into him at a conference a couple of years ago. And I was like, man, I didn't think that we would have such a similar job, like you being in, you know, collegiate sports and me being in the military, but like we do the very similar things. Um, so no, I definitely didn't env envision like what it is now. I always knew I'd probably work with other dietitians, but um, it's been really nice to work with different disciplines because I found like in my role as a dietitian, I'm often talking about things like, you know, how to sleep better um, basic recommendations for physical activity to help them become more active. Um, because I'm only a dietitian, like I don't have those other people, like, unless I refer them and like hope that they make an appointment, um, yeah. how do I know they're going to get that information? But now I can solely dedicate my time with a soldier to nutrition and be like, Oh, you're having sleep issues. I'm going to send you to my teammate over here. Who's like the expert and you're going to go talk to them. So that's really nice. Um, and something that I've, I've really enjoyed. And I know, um, some people in this program have kind of had problems with like discipline overlap and having to draw those really distinct lines of like who does what and because mm -hmm. you're used to being the only person that does it. Yeah. Um, but I personally am totally happy to defer to somebody else for some of that stuff. So yeah. Do you think you're always going to want to work on a team or like how do you think I mean, eventually, or unless you want to make a career out of being in the military, like how do you think you would do not having those people like readily available yeah I haven't thought about that um I'm not <laughs> I'm not sure about career military just quite yet um yeah that's it's 20 years is a big commitment and it's a lot bigger than I thought it was going to be when I first like um started so mm -hmm. I'm six years in now and doing 14 more I'm not really sure um but I don't know. I guess I'm kind of spoiled having the team I have right now. And I can't really imagine not having that. So mm -hmm. um, if I ever were to get out and find myself and I don't know, like private practice or working in a hospital or something, I'd probably find a way to make it work where I can at least know who's there, you know, to kind of fill in that gap. Um, 
it'd probably be more on the forefront of my mind to find that information out than it would have been had I not done this position. So how do you think working on a team has like developed your skills as an RD? Like I know you said you like being able to refer people to others, but how do you think it's like built onto like, like life skills, not even just being an RD, but how does it, like how has being on a team helped you? Um, well, I'm actually in physical therapy right now. So working with one has been great. Um, and then working with my OT has been great because I've been able to like ask him about sleep and stress and all that mm-hmm. stuff that he does. So um, we're, we're like highly encouraged to get to know the people that we work with and understand what it is that they do. And I think the best way that you can do that is to be their patient. So mm-hmm. if there's something wrong and you know that they can help you, like going to them is going to help you understand better how they treat their patients. Um, which will help you kind of speak to their knowledge a little bit better as well. Um, So I think that for me, that's been like super beneficial. I think I answered your question. I just like totally went off on a tangent there. No, you definitely did. Okay. And then I I forgot to ask another question from a student, um, but Kirsten asked, what obstacles do you face as an RD in the military? Oh, so many. Um, so being really flexible is super important. Like if you're somebody that expects things to go exactly the way that you have planned, like you probably don't want to be in the military (laughs) because like I said, like that could all get swept out from under your feet. Um, so that's a big barrier. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then sometimes it can just be stressful. I mean, with the military, I I think there's a lot of flexibility in the schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, like if my kid is sick and I need to go home, it's not like I'm having to take sick time. Like I just go home. Like the military doesn't have a punch card, right? You just work. Um, Cause you'll sometimes have to pull 24 hour duties. Like I have one next Saturday. So that kind of stinks. But um, so there's like some stuff that's really challenging, but there's also a lot of like positives that help you overcome those obstacles a little bit easier. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it can be tricky when you have to be like taken away from your family and you work long hours because your soldiers are working long hours um, or you're sleeping in a tent in the field or no tent, just a sleeping bag in the field. Like yeah. Those kind of things are probably challenging for some people, but um, I find there's so much benefit to the military. It kind of like outweighs all the obstacles that you face. Yeah. So kind of building off of that, what obstacles do you face as a woman in the military, if any? Or it's like a female RD or just, I don't want to say a female, I don't want to say in power because like, I don't think that's the right word, but you're higher ranked. So yeah, and how does so, that look? Interestingly, so when I, when I started, um, when I did the first pilot back in 2017 for this, like going into an infantry unit, which is predominantly male, right? So mm-hmm. in the hospital setting, it's, you know, fairly evenly split male, female, yeah. and the dietitian side is pretty female dominant in the military even. Um, but going to basically an all male unit and mm-hmm. being one of the only females on my team, um, I was told like, you need to expect that you're probably not going to get a fair shake for being a female. And then I showed up there and everyone was so nice to me. Like all my commanders, like were super easy to get along with. And I almost found Great. that they were more resistant to the males on my team. I don't know if it's just like a macho thing. Um, but I've never really, I've never really encountered barriers as a result of me being a a female, um, in the military. I I feel like, um, because I'm a captain probably though, um, and because I'm a professional in a sense that like, I'm the only dietitian, right? So there's only one of me. Mm -hmm. Um, so when people need something, they come to me. Like there's no one else that I'm competing with for that, um, mm-hmm. that role. Um, so they just kind of defer to me, but I've never experienced, I'm sure people have, um, mm-hmm. in a male dominated organization, I'm sure it happens, but I've just been really fortunate and I roll really well with punches too. Like coming from a military family, I don't like take things harshly when people goof around. So, um, I don't know. I've really enjoyed it. So. <laughs> So on your team of 37, like what's the ratio for like men to women? Right now we only have six of those people on ground. Um, We're still in the process of hiring. Um, Mm -hmm. But right now we have 
my PT, OT, and both strength coaches are male. Our program director will be a male. Mm-hmm. My athletic trainer is a female. So her and I are the two lone females right now. Um, the civilian dietitian that I hire will more than likely be a female. Um, but as far as the other positions go, I'm not sure. And I'm not hiring her because she's a female. It's just all, all the applicants that I know of are female. So <laughs> not discriminating. Yeah. yeah. So you are in the army, obviously. So do like the Navy and the Marine Corps and Air Force, do they have programs like your program or do you have like no idea or how does, like, why is it for the army? Yeah. So out of the, um, the services, the army, Navy and Air Force are the only ones that have dietitians. So the Navy provides like the medical support Mm -hmm. to the Marines. Um, but the air force is standing up something similar. I believe, I think it's predominantly civilian driven in terms of Mm -hmm. like the people that providers being civilians, just because they have very few dietitians, Mm -hmm. Um, the Navy and the air force have dramatically fewer dietitians than the army does just because they're a smaller force by nature. But, um, the army is plussing up numbers like crazy right now. So we're, we're expanding quite significantly. And I think the Navy has something kind of similar to that I've heard about. Cool. So you said that you were looking at hiring a civilian RD. So do you not have to be in the military to work in the military or? No, that's a great, that's a great question, actually. Um, No, the answer is no. Um, We actually have pretty much all of the dietitians at Madigan are civilian that are actually functioning as a staff dietitian. Um, the admin people who are like in charge of the clinic are typically military. Um, but all of my preceptors that were dietitians were civilians. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there might've been like one that was, yeah, there was like one that was military. Um, but in the H2F program, the way that it's laid out, um, there's two different types of units. There's a tier one and a tier two unit. And it really kind of has to do with um, like size, but also the population. Mm-hmm. So a tier one has military for PTOTRD, and then they have civilians and military that fall underneath them. Yeah. Um, but a tier two brigade that has like a smaller, different population only has a civilian dietitian. They don't have a military dietitian. Okay. Um, So that's just the way that it's built um, because there's not enough of us to kind of fill all these roles. And in the special operations community um, for like special forces, like the guys that wear the green berets and then the Rangers, they they have civilian dietitians as well. And those are contracted positions. So we have contractors and we have government like GS employees. And those are the two different distinctions there. Um, but we have a good mix of those across the military just because we don't have enough of us to fill those positions. So if I walked into Madigan tomorrow, like, and I had like my credentials, everything, what advantages or disadvantages would I have working with those who are in the military in a military hospital? Um, advantages versus disadvantages in terms of like the job compared to an outside, like a civilian dietitian job? Sure, yeah. I don't really know where I was going with that, but I think that's what I was trying to ask. No, no. I mean, there's great benefits in the GS system, Mm -hmm. Um, like good time off, good insurance, pretty good job security. Um, Mm -hmm. So there's that. The pay is pretty good comparative to like what you would find on the outside. Um, So those are some pretty good benefits. And then... um, your bosses change out a lot. If you don't like your boss, you'll probably get a new one in like two or three years if they're military. So, but if you don't like change, then it's probably not a good um, fit again, even being Mm -hmm. a civilian in the military, because there's a lot of change in the military healthcare system. We just did a complete changeover um, in the way that we're structured, where like all of the services fall under one unifying like agency for all medical, like Air Force, Army, Navy, it's all under one where we used to each have our own. So that was huge. That was like a huge shift in the paradigm. Um, and it's changed like how many civilians we have versus military working in the hospital and all of that stuff. So that was a big shift. And I know a lot of the civilians um, uh, had kind of a tough time with that transition as did the military. So it can be tricky at times. 
So other than like being enlisted in the, or enrolled, I guess enlisted in the military and having those benefits, is it like, I don't want to say equal pay, but would you get paid more in the military than as a um, civilian or? Um, yes, probably, because if you're a military dietitian, um, you also get um, housing allowance, which is tax free. Okay. And that's dependent on your rank and location. And then you get uh, subsistence for food um, every month as well. Um, and your health care is free. Um, you get college, you get GI Bill. So there's a lot of stuff that you get on top of just your base salary that makes it like, when we came into the GPN program as second lieutenants, which is the lowest enlisted rank, we were already probably making more than most dietitians that have five years experience on the civilian side as students, wow. not credentialed. So wow. it's a great program that nobody knows about. Well, I have to figure out how to tell my parents I'm going to apply to Baylor. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's like probably like the only paid internship that you'll find as a dietitian. Yeah, so like, how do you think, like, how do you think that intern, I mean, I know you didn't really look into other internships, right? I think you mentioned that. Yeah, I only applied to Baylor. <laughs> I put all my eggs in one basket. So compared to like peers and stuff, how do you think your experience helped shape and like prepare you for life, I guess, compared to like other internships? Um, I don't know. Like that's hard to say just because I, I didn't go through other their internships. Um, I mean, I, I still got all the same, like I went through, I went through, um, well, we didn't do WIC, but we did like some community stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we did like food service, we did clinical, we did outpatient. Um, we had a really good variety. So I know some internships can be like hyper-focused in one area, like very food service heavy or very clinical heavy. Mm -hmm. But ours was kind of a good like smattering of everything. So in that sense, I got prepared to do whatever job the army wanted me to do. Cause like, again, we didn't really have super, a whole lot of say in like what we were going to do for our mm -hmm. follow on assignment. So, um, you wanted to make sure you were well-rounded. That's good. Yeah, I'm sure. So what is your favorite part about being an RD in the military? Like if there was one thing, like one takeaway or like one thing that you could convince or not convince, but like for people that are listening, like if they're on the brink of like, I might go for Baylor, I might not. What would you tell them? I think a lot of people that I've talked to about this um, internship, their hesitation is like, I don't want to get deployed or I don't mm -hmm. want to be like away. Um, and like, I guess now, like I have a child now. So like for me, that that's a little bit more like challenging to deal with. Um, but if you're like single or just don't have kids, like, don't be afraid of that. I mean, even if you have kids, like it's still a great opportunity, but um, it's an opportunity to go to places you probably never, ever go in your life. If you should get that chance, like you can go to, to like I said, like Thailand, the Philippines, they're going to Guam, which is where my husband is from. And he's going to be really jealous if I get to go to Guam um you can go to Korea you can go Italy like anywhere in the world like the military can can take you um and and it's an opportunity to to get to see and meet so many different people um like if you you know have a desire to experience like nutrition through different cultures like the army is one way that you can definitely do that because I I deal with people, I don't say deal with, I see people and get to interact with people um, from like Hispanic cultures, from Asian cultures, from Pacific Island cultures, um, from places I've never even heard about. Like someone was like, oh, I'm from Ponape. I'm like, where, where the heck is Ponape? And I'm like, oh, it's one of the little tiny islands right by Guam, um, Tonga, like people from everywhere. And you get to learn so much about their food culture. So as a dietitian, it's been really fascinating for me, even if I don't get to go to the those places, I get to talk to people who have lived there or grew up there um, and have those traditions. So don't be afraid of the deployment aspect if that's something that you're kind of like hung up on with it. Um, but for me too, like I grew up in a military family, like my dad deployed two times when I was like in high school and college 
mm-hmm. and was gone all the time with the military. So I guess I was kind of used to that um, separation. So it didn't really scare me as much. Um, but I know it can be kind of a deterrent for a lot of people. I'm sure. Yeah, I think because I, I was so gung ho for the military when I was like in high school. And then I'm like, you know what, I think I want to do college and then I'll reevaluate. And that was one of the things I was worried about. I'm like, I might end up in the middle of nowhere. Like I could end up in like Idaho or something or in like Italy. But like, I didn't even know if that was possible. That was definitely me speaking, just yeah, speaking and stuff. You but could one- definitely end up in the middle of nowhere. I will tell you that. <laughs> it's a very real possibility where is one place that like you want to travel or that you if you were like I wish I could get stationed here where would you want to be stationed to um I really would love Germany because like everyone that I know that has been stationed in Germany is like you have to go there because yeah. you can travel like it's so easy to just like travel all over Europe like on a weekend right sure. um And then also Guam, like I said, my husband's from Guam and it's like super expensive to go there just to travel there. (laughs) Um, So if we could at least like go there for like a trip, like a short trip with my unit or something, like that would be awesome. Like, I don't know about getting stationed there. I'm kind of not a fan of being stationed on a small island, like surrounded by water. But um, yeah, I would love to go to either of those places. It's like the military, the army, you'll see the world. Yeah. Uh yeah Yeah. or just Uh, Idaho I don't know yeah yeah. or Idaho wherever wherever (laughs) they decide to put you yeah uh so I guess I can finish with one last question it's gonna be very basic what is your favorite food oh gosh you didn't prepare me for that one Uh, (laughs) oh can I just go like like a category of food instead of like okay I love Mexican food and hmm. I can eat it like every day of the week and my husband hates it. <laughs> Mexican like Chipotle or like a like um, I, and tacos kind of thing. Like enchiladas are probably my number one favorite Mexican food. So I make those quite often. Um, hmm. And then like fajitas probably. But yeah, I, I make it like at least once or twice every week. Is there an MRE with enchiladas in it or no? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think they do have like a fajita one or some kind of Mexican dish, but I don't know that I've ever tried it. I didn't want to ruin that experience for myself. It isn't that bad. I mean, yeah, you just heat it up a little bit. It'll be like a nice lukewarm enchilada. They do have one that has taco shells. Hmm. I just don't remember which one it is. It probably isn't anything to do with Mexican food. They just have tortillas as a side. (laughs) Usually I make like a peanut butter and jelly out of them. It's pretty good, actually. That sounds good. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us and hopping on. I appreciated it and talking to you. It's great to to hear about the military because, you know, it's something people like, like you said, oh, I'm going to go get deployed. But you don't think about all the domestic stuff and like you're staying in your job for what, eight years probably staying in one area. And that's probably not something people are used to. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I appreciate it, Steph. And I I really am glad you were able to go into this stuff because our whole point of doing this is for students to look at all these different career opportunities, right? So looking at, and this is me reflecting, like we started in the same place and had same internship and had two completely different career paths. So a lot of students may look at oh, a sports dietitian or oh, an army dietitian and think that is a career path without realizing, hey, there's 15, 20, 30, 40 different avenues within that. And, and I think that's super helpful to hear you talk through that and, and really appreciate that. I think I owe Emily an MRE. I got some really expired ones. So I'll, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can at least, oh, you can at least look at them, but oh, again, gosh. Thank you so much for those listening. We'll um, keep putting these out every week. Follow along. Um, make sure uh, you hop over to the rd2b.com website. Uh, we got another week and change of signups open for the mentorship program. Uh, talked a lot about it. So go back to the previous week's um, video. We talked about that. Super excited. Steph was one of the mentors last go around. 
Uh, we have a ton of people involved. So if you're a dietitian listening to this, please sign up. Um, we yeah. can only um, offer so many slots to students as long as we have dietitians. We have a ton, but uh, can never have too many. So again, thank you guys both. And uh, we'll see you next week.